Hi there, and welcome to Grab Bag Season 3, Episode 4. I would have this kind of, <laughs> maybe a warning. Uh, today we're going to dig a little deeper than we often do. You know, there's a lot, there are a lot of people who just like to skim the surface of the Bible, get some sweet sounding, nice feeling, good words and truths that they can live by. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But we're challenging the Bible to not just want the milk of the word, but to want the meat of the word. And sometimes that takes some digger deeping. Some digger deep, some deeper, some deeper. There you go, right off the front, they give you something to laugh about. Take some deeper digging. There you go. Uh, you know, we can go around being what they say a mile wide and an inch deep, or we can just take some time and dig a little deeper or deep a little digger. <laughs> So what that means is you might want to have, have to put on a little bit more of a thinking cap as we go through. And I, but I hope this helps your understanding of what Jesus is going to say in this portion of John chapter 11, which we are going to study. We remember from the last lesson that Jesus and his disciples hear that Lazarus has died. Uh, Jesus had said he was sick. And then finally, he just plainly tells them, look, Lazarus died. And we're going to go back, and but I'm glad that he died because this is all going to be for the glory of God. So he arrives at the outskirts of Bethany, the home of Lazarus and Martha and Mary, Lazarus's sisters. And Martha and Mary hear of Jesus' arrival, and Martha is very quick to go to Jesus. Martha is the, the homemaker. I mean, if you think Martha Stewart, you know, she's the one who's always planning the parties and serving and getting everything together, making sure that everything is taken care of. So she would have been the sister who greeted all of the guests, the mourners who had come from as far away as uh, Jerusalem, uh, which was only two miles to us. That's not too far, but it had been, been a good walk for a lot of people to come and to just spend time. They didn't just come and then leave. Oftentimes these funerals just went on and on and people stayed and joined in mourning parties, yada, yada, yada. So, um, but Martha would have been the one to make sure that they were taken care of, most, most concerned that all was going according to uh, customs. While Mary remains behind in the house, Martha goes to greet Jesus and um, I wouldn't have been surprised if Martha just would have said, now, Mary, you know, I'll go meet Jesus. I'll take care of things. You just stay here with the mourners. And so in John chapter 11, we pick up in verse 21. Martha has come to Jesus and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Now, when you look at that, you think, is this the way that Martha greeted Jesus? You know, I mean, I hope not. Hopefully she greeted this, fam this family friend with a nice Jewish welcome and some small talk before launching into what seems like a veiled accusation. You know, Lord, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. Her reason for sending a message to Jesus about her brother's sickness was in the hopes that Jesus would return and heal her brother before he died. Now, now, grief toys with one's emotions. So perhaps Martha was somewhat angry. I mean, Jesus is a friend and he didn't immediately come back. And so she said, if you had been here, if you had come back like I wanted you to and sent for you to, then this wouldn't have happened. Well, whether her words were a subtle accusation wrapped in a touch of anger or a simple statement about her disappointment, she still held, holds out hope because after she says, if you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened, she says, but I know <laughs> kind of that you have God's ear. I know a resurrection is possible. God will give you whatever you ask. After all, Jesus had resurrected a boy who lived in the town of Nain, that's recorded in Luke chapter 7. So why not raise Lazarus? 
Why not raise him here and now? Verse 23 of John says that Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus tells Martha that she's going to get what she wants. Her brother will rise. But it's almost as though Martha wants some clarification. Will Jesus raise her brother right now? Or was Jesus just referring to the final resurrection of the dead at the end of time? And so she says, now I know he's going to rise uh, in the resurrection on the last day. You see, like Christians, the Jews believed in one ultimate resurrection at the end of time, followed by the afterlife. You know, a lot of our root, we call it the Judeo-Christian heritage because a lot of our Christian roots are found in um, basic Judaism. You know, we, our old New Testament is built on the Old Testament. And so hearing Jesus say, your brother will rise again, fit just fine in Martha's Jewish theology. And she affirms that she agrees with Jesus. I know he will rise in the last day resurrection. But as we now know, Jesus's words held a more immediate and glorious meaning that Martha was soon to experience. In verse 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha responds, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now, these verses are a treasure trove, especially verses 25 and 26 give us valuable information about who Jesus identifies himself to be. They're also a valuable source of hope for Christians in the despairing world especially in the face of death. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, when you read that, it may sound like Jesus is being redundant. You know, he's just saying the same thing different ways. But that's not so. Resurrection and life are two parts of one event. Like when our parents would tell us, wake up and get up. Well, you can't get up until you wake up. It's two parts of one event. And so likewise with resurrection and life, if you have died, you can't have life until you resurrect. They're two separate parts. So Jesus was not being redundant and just repeating the same claim about himself when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And here's where I say, you may have to put on our thinking caps because we're going to break it down a little further. And I'm going to try to slow down. I, I know I'm supposed to get through this quickly, but I'm afraid of talking to that. Well, we'll just go. Here we go. The Greek word for resurrection is a word, ana, anastasos, anastasos. And it's a combination of two words meaning up and cause to stand. So resurrection means to cause to stand up, implying that standing up after death would be impossible if a third party did not exert power and cause one to stand. Got that? Standing up but it's because somebody else exerts power and causes you to stand up. In this case, maybe somebody like uh, God. <laughs> Jesus was making a statement about his divinity when he said, I am the resurrection. I am the one who can exert power to cause a dead body to stand. Now, the Greek word translated life Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, is the Greek word zoe. Sometimes we hear of, you know, kids that are being named zoe. It's actually the Greek word zoe, which means life. Zoe life is different from the other Greek word for life, 
which is bios. Bios is the source of our word biology, and it infers physical life. So zoe in the New Testament is used of life in an absolute sense, life as God has it, life which the Father gave to the incarnate Son to have in himself. See, bios is physical life, zoe is eternal soul life. Man became a living soul. Zoe life was in the Father and in Jesus, his incarnate son. Incarnate means to become flesh, right? So in Jesus, his incarnate son. John wrote this in his letter, his epistle. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we are proclaiming to you concerning the word of life, zoe, the word of life. This zoe life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you, listen, the eternal life, zoe, the eternal zoe, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. This is Jesus, the eternal life that was with the Father but has now appeared to us. He is God incarnate. He is the Word become flesh. So with that information, hopefully you can see that the resurrection and life are two parts of one event. That resurrection, a body standing up is one thing. Having life or zoe from God, that's another thing. Two parts of one event. Jesus is saying, I am God. I have the power to raise up a physical body and I have the power to infuse it with, and make it a living soul by giving it life. Okay? Jesus is the resurrection. He has the power over death on both the bios level and on the zoe level. Jesus can and he will resurrect the physical body that of Lazarus, as he told Martha. She will see a bodily resurrection. She will get exactly what she wanted. However, for there to be life as we know it, every physical body needs a spirit, and that spirit needs life or zoe to sustain it. So Jesus calling himself the resurrection and the life is saying that he has the power of God to cause Lazarus's body to stand up, to restore the bios or physical life, but he also has the power of God to restore zoe or spiritual life. As I said earlier, two parts of one event. But we gotta understand that behind all of this, more than just a biology lesson, Jesus is teaching a spiritual lesson. You remember in our past um, grab bag session, they talked about the fact that Jesus used the word sleep when he referred to Lazarus being dead. There was a spiritual meaning behind that. So uh, that use of the word sleep. Well, in the same way, Jesus is teaching Martha and of course the disciples who surely were present when Martha came to see Jesus, he was teaching the spiritual truth by using physical events of death and resurrection of Lazarus. I should have said by using these physical events of the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. And this spiritual lesson, get this, the spiritual lesson that Jesus is going to teach was the reason that Jesus waited to return to Bethany after Lazarus died. I mean, Jesus could have returned early and, and healed Lazarus. Jesus could have healed Lazarus from a distance, but he had a spiritual lesson that he wanted to teach Martha and the disciples and all those around. 
a lesson that would glorify God. And for that reason, Jesus delayed going back to Bethany. And the spiritual lesson that he's going to teach is, behind, is linked up to the physical miracle that he's going to perform. You got that? The spiritual lesson about resurrection and life is linked to the physical miracle he's going to perform in the resurrection and new life of Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus was not being redundant when he said that he was the resurrection and the life. And by the way, that powerful message, I am the resurrection and the life, was the same message that Jesus was teaching through his own death and resurrection. Jesus died and rose again to prove that he is the resurrection and the life, which also then proves his divinity as the Son of God. Now, on the basis of the truth about his identity and power, as a resurrection and life, Jesus is going to make an exclusive claim about himself. And I, I want you to understand that the claim that Jesus is going to make about himself in the next sentence, verse, the last half of verse 25 and verse 26, this claim is not true at all unless Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus cannot make the claim he's going to make unless he is the resurrection and the life. And so it's like Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Therefore, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And then verse 26, and the, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. <coughs> Excuse me. And once again, I'm not gonna try and fly through here, but uh, I'm gonna take a, just slow her down a little bit. Because the literal Greek reading in verse 25b is this, the one believing in me, even if he should die, he will live. Now, the death, even if he should die, that death spoken of in the last part of verse 25 is physical death. In other words, the end of bios life. Yet the word that's translated live, like he will live, translated live in English, is a form of the Greek word zoe, which we know is different than physical life. It is the life that comes from God. It's a spiritual life. So though one believing in Jesus dies physically, he or she will still live spiritually. That's what Jesus is saying. The one believing in me, even if he should die physically, he will live spiritually. So I want to draw your attention to the literal wording, the one believing in me. The NIV, if you're using a New International Version, the NIV reads, the one who believes in me. And here's why I want to slow down a little bit, because I hope you can perceive the difference, even feel kind of the difference between the one who believes in me and the one believing in me. You see, the first one, the one who believes in me, is far more passive than the second, the one believing in me. The one believing in me gives the picture of someone active and involved in belief. They're believing. And we might call that person a practicing believer as opposed to a casual believer, which would be more described like they believe in me. 
But look at verse 26. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. The literal translation of verse 26 is, everyone living and believing in me will never die. So again, do you hear and see the difference be, between whoever lives and believes in me and the phrase, everyone living and believing in me? Again, the first is more passive. It's more generic, whoever lives and believes in me. But the, the second is more active and intentional, everyone living and believing in me. In other words, they're in action with their belief and their life in Christ. So in verse 25, the conclusion, we have the one believing in me will live spiritually, though he dies physically. And in verse 26, we have everyone living and believing in me will never die spiritually. Jesus teaches that only those actively believing and living in him will live eternally, though eternally, not internally, I'm sorry. Only those actively believing and living in him will live eternally, though they die physically. Now, I hope you were able to follow along with that. That, that subtle difference that there is. And if you were snorkeling through that, <laughs> then you may want to put on your scuba gear <laughs> for the next bit, because I want us to go even just a little bit deeper. Okay, ready? <gasps> the Greek word that the NIV translates as believes is the word pistuon. Pistuon. Now, why is this important for you to know? I mean, are you going to become a Greek student? No, I'm not a great Greek student either. But I find it valuable and important right here to know because the Greek word for faith is the Greek word pistis. Pistis. And the word translated believes Pistuon is actually a form of the word pistis, or faith. In other words, to be really precise and accurate, the phrase that's translated, the one who believes in me, is literally the one who is faithing in me. <laughs> that's awkward for us to say in English, but that's the idea. The one who believes in me is literally the one who is faithing, faithing in me. And that's important because there is a difference between belief and faith. So when you're talking about the one who believes in me, you want to get as close to the original understanding as you can. And so what it should be is the one who is faithing in me. And with that, you have to know the difference between faith and belief, or belief and faith. See, belief is saying that a bridge will hold the weight as you drive across it. Faith is actually driving across the bridge. It's one thing to say, yeah, I believe that that bridge is safe. It's another thing to get on the bridge and go across it. One is belief. The second one is faithing. It's faith. See, belief is more of a cerebral agreeing to information. Faith is active involvement. Because faith has a crucial ingredient that belief does not. And that ingredient, that ingredient is what we just simply call obedience. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, we read, Jesus was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. See, faith has at its core a, 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 a the essential ingredient of obedience. True faith incorporates obedience. That's why James would say, faith without works, it's dead. Belief is more of a, an agreement to facts, where faith is an active involvement and an obedience. So why is this important? Well, let's go back. Jesus did not teach, I am the resurrection and the life, the one who believes in me, who has mere mental acknowledgement of me, though he dies, will still have eternal life. What Jesus taught was, I am the resurrection and the life, therefore, the one faithing in me, the one obeying, the one actively living in me, that's the one who will have zoe life. And even though he dies, has a bios death, and the one living, having zoe life and faithing, obediently trusting in me, then that person will never die. And he wasn't speaking physical that that person will then never have zoe life. The positive phrase would be that person has eternal life. It's the one who is faithing, the one who is obedient to me. You see, Jesus sets a higher, much more active and intentional commitment bar for eternal life than just, oh, you can believe in me. You can, you can believe I existed. You can just say, mouth some words about me being the son of God if you want to, you know. Jesus requires obedience to his word. Okay, hopefully you can take off your scuba gear. And you can ask, well, why did you take us that deep? Why, why these word studies? Why didn't you just tell us <laughs> what to think? Well, I, I don't wanna like, in a sense, cut off your head and pour a bunch of stuff in there. I want, I hopefully challenge you to think and to understand, and maybe even to pursue a deeper level of Bible study, you know, to, to go back and to challenge yourself to look at what Jesus is saying, the biblical meaning behind some of the statements, and to maybe even look at some original language Bible study helps to, to help you get some deeper meaning in your Bible study. And so that's why I took you that I hope it, it was understandable. Since you're not there, I don't even, I don't know if it is. I hope it is. And if it is, you know, you see me somewhere, at least come up and say, hey, Rob, I did understand what you were saying. Or if you didn't say, hey, Rob, I didn't understand. Can you tell me again? Can you help me understand? And I'll, I'll do my best. But so why, why did we come this way? Why did I take you down a little deeper than just the surface stuff? Well, here's why. In our present religious climate, people are told that if you just believe in Jesus, then you're good to go. You know, just, just believe in Jesus. But what does it mean to believe in Jesus? And I'm afraid, seriously, I'm afraid that there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians and say they believe in Jesus, but they aren't living and faithing in Jesus. They've been fooled by Satan. You know, they think, I just need a vague knowledge about Jesus. I just need to go to church consistently, maybe pray once in a while, you know, and, and, and be a good person. And then I'll be okay. But think about what Jesus taught at the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember when I talked about the Thompson chain link? And what's exciting about the Bible is when you study one thing, it links you to another thing. You know, you got to bring 
all of these things together as best you can under the understanding of the Holy Spirit. So think about what we've just talked about, that the person who is truly living and faithing, being obedient to Jesus, this is the one who will have eternal life. Now look at what Jesus said at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Remember the what Jesus taught when he thought about the, the wise man built his house upon the rock. Everyone who, listen, hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. That's a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rains come, the streams rise, the winds blow, beat against the house, but it doesn't fall because it has its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice. Well, that person is like a foolish man who built his house on sand, and the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. In John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Jesus is saying, I am the Son of God. I am divine. I'm telling you exactly what the Father is telling me to say. And the Father is saying to me that one way that people can see that you love him is by being obedient to his teaching. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So if you don't obey the teaching of Jesus, then you don't love Jesus and you don't love the Father. Hmm. That doesn't sound simply like, eh, just believe in me. In John 15, 9, we read, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. You see, this is living and faithing in Christ. Jesus' statements to many people may seem harsh and unsympathetic. But I hope you can see why I have grave concern for many Christians today, even in my own family. Because there are so many people who just think, I just have to have like a working knowledge of Jesus, and that's it. But Jesus sets a higher bar and a higher standard. Now, I truly hope that Jesus grades on a very steep curve under the blood of Jesus. I mean, he knows how desperately I need forgiveness. I'm not perfect. But I hope that he has a, such a, a wide, wide heart in, in, in forgiving and understanding people who think I can, basically, I can live the way I want to live as long as I just acknowledge Jesus. Hey, there you are. Good. Okay. To draw a quick summary to our narrative then, in John chapter 11, Jesus says to Martha, I am, or, I am the resurrection and the life. And, and then he asked her, do you believe this? And she responds, yes, she believes that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, the one who was to come. Yes, she believes that he is the resurrection and the life. And she, in a sense, gives a statement of faith when she affirms that she has faith in Jesus. In other words, she said, I believe. There again, it's that Greek word that's a form of the word pistis, which means faith. She's saying, yes, I have faith in you as Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God coming into the world. And then John says that 
Martha hurries off to get her sister Mary, who comes to Jesus with the same questioning accusation about Jesus's delayed arrival. If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. You know, sometimes our friends and even we ourselves accuse God for not arriving to help when they or we feel it was most needed. But let this lesson be comforting to us that God is in control, that he is being glorified. That was the whole purpose of Jesus delaying, that God could be glorified. So let's believe that God is being glorified even when we don't see through the shadows, just as Martha and Mary and the disciples didn't see through the shadows. When we have questions slash accusations, we can trust that's part of faithing. <laughs> we can trust that God is doing what is right. And so let's keep faithing in him. So now it's time for Jesus to go to the tomb of Lazarus, and we're going to join him there in our next lesson. I hope that you are reading John chapter 11 in preparation for each of these lessons. So um, I'm going to shut it down right here. And I will see you, Lord willing, next Sunday.